Well, good morning, everyone. What a blessing it is to get to be here. Last week, we started looking at Acts chapter 10, part one of Obedient Messengers. Today is going to be part two. I was talking to a friend of mine at work. Uh, He was asking me what I'm preaching at church, and so I told him that last week I did part one of Acts chapter 10, and then, of course, this Sunday, today is going to be part two, and he goes, oh, did you do that to bring him back because it's the Super Bowl? (laughs) Because I didn't do that on purpose. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, I suppose. That's not why, but it makes sense. So part two today for the Super Bowl. So as you remember last week, I opened up with this story about the Arabian horses. Anybody remember this story about the Arabian horses, training them, getting them perfectly trained so that by the time they get to the water's edge, after being parched for a long period of time, if they're obediently trained, they stop. And I challenged you with being an obedient messenger, trained like an Arabian horse. And as we went through Last week, part one, we saw how obedient these messengers were. And I hope that this week, if there was any message that you needed to give to someone, I pray that you were obedient in being that kind of messenger. Giving the message that you're supposed to give to whom you're supposed to give it. Did you notice last week as we were going through this that not one link in the chain was broken? Every one of these messengers, every one of these messages was completely delivered. Not one link of the chain was broken. This week we go to part two. And as we go through this second part of obedient messengers, the rest of chapter 10, does anybody anybody read this second half of Acts chapter 10? You knew it was coming. You knew it was coming. Acts chapter 10, we're going to finish this out. So last week, we started. God wants you to see the value of obedient messengers. Of obedient messengers. There are six different messages of obedience given in this chapter. Last week, are you ready, Kalia? This is the first three from last week. The first message, verses 1 through 8. This is what we looked at last week. A message from... For Cornelius from an angel. Verses 1 through 8, a message for Cornelius from an angel. Change is required, was the message. Now, Cheryl, you're going to love this because there's six total points and they're all doubly alliterated. I know. Second message, verses 9 through 16, a message for Peter from heaven. Cleanliness is resisted. The third message, a message for Peter from the messengers. As we went through this, we saw who those messengers were. Verses 17 through 23, a message for Peter from the messengers. A charge is requested. Part two, the fourth message, a message for Peter from Cornelius, verses 24 through 33, clarity is relieved. Fifth message, verses 34 through 43, a message for Cornelius from Peter. A command is returned. <clears throat> Getting all these, Kalia? Am I going too slow or too fast? Perfect. Sixth message. Verses 44 through 48. A message for Cornelius from the Holy Spirit. A connection is resulted. So as we're, we're going to read this, verses 24 through 48, the second half of Acts chapter 10, and you tell me if you got the same thing. And the following day they entered Caesarea, 
Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. And then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked them, for what reason have you sent for me? So Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayers have been heard. Your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent you, sent for you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now therefore, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, that word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. While Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And they asked him to stay there a few days. Did you get the same messages that I got? The message for Peter from Cornelius. A message for Cornelius from Peter. And a message for Cornelius from the Holy Spirit. These are the messages. And these are the messengers. And we read this together. So now let's look at this a little bit more carefully. Starting in verse 24, a message for Peter from Cornelius. As you remember, this angel had appeared to Cornelius in verse 1 or 2 or 3 or whatever it was in the beginning. This angel had given a message to Cornelius, and Cornelius was confused, and so he was commissioned to send these messengers out to find Peter. Now we pick up in verse 24, these messengers have arrived to Peter. The following day, they entered Caesarea, and Cornelius, waiting for them, had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter is coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. See, Cornelius was this just man, was this God-fearing man, even if he was a Gentile. I know, right? What is this Gentile doing as a God-fearing man? I mean, I mean, have you ever, you know, when you look at a dog and they just kind of tilt their head at you? Like they kind of get what you're saying, but they're just happy to be there. When I say to you that a Gentile is a God-fearing person and a just man who gives alms and stuff like this, all of a sudden you should go, really? Interesting. 
A Gentile doing these things, huh? I know, right? A Gentile doing these things? This is not possible, is it? And here Peter is with this guy, and this guy now wants to kneel down at the feet of Peter because he understands what's going on here. He understands that the true God of this universe is of the Jews. He doesn't know all the ins and the outs yet. He doesn't have all the pieces of the puzzle, but he knows enough to understand that the Jews are God's special people, and Peter is now the spokesman. And you respect that man. And this is how Cornelius was trying to respect him, and Peter just doesn't get it. Peter's just a common dude. And so when Cornelius meets him, falls down at his feet to worship him, Peter lifts him up and says, stand up, for I myself am also a man. We're all in this together, guys. Did you realize, have you recognized that just because I'm up here doesn't make me any better than you? All God's people said amen. amen. It doesn't matter who's up in this pulpit. It doesn't matter if you see him on TV or you hear him on the radio. It doesn't matter what kind of audience they have or how many books they've written, how long they've been doing it or where they're from or what their pedigree is or anything about them. We're all in this together. There ain't a one of us that's any better than anybody else. And the way that God designed salvation was to absolutely ensure that that was always going to be a reality. Praise God for his indescribable gift that none of us can ever earn on our own and somehow make us, some of us, better than others. Peter says, I am just a man. I'm no better than you. Get up. And as he talked together with him, he went and found many who had come together. So now we, we're getting a bit of a crowd here. We got these messages from Cornelius. We got Cornelius himself. We got Peter had a delegation with him, as you remember that. We got a whole, there's a, there's a little congregation here. We got a little church revival going on here is what it sounds like. We got the makings of something big here. Then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company or go with anybody else from another nation. Peter's saying this to him. Peter says, almost as, you know, I don't know. This is kind of interesting. He says, you know, I'm not supposed to be with you right now, right? You know, this is not okay. You know, this is how this is supposed to go. But here I am. Because God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Clarity is relieved. God has shown something different to Peter than what he'd been used to for his whole life, for his parents' life, for his grandparents' life, for generation after generation after generation, the Jews were taught certain principles. You don't intermingle with the Gentiles. You only eat certain animals. You don't eat other animals. There are some things that are clean. There are some things that are unclean. There are certain people that are clean. There are certain people that are unclean. And we have this whole rigmarole list of rules that we're supposed to follow. And Peter knew them. You might want to call him a common fisherman, but he knew the rules. They all did. For generations, this information is passed down. And God's shown him that he should not call any man common or unclean. God has flipped the script now. Clarity now. We have some clarity on what God wants us to do. So the next time you're out somewhere and you see somebody that doesn't like kind of look like they, you know, belong or something like that, don't think to yourself, maybe I shouldn't share Jesus with them. There is everybody on this planet deserves to have Jesus shared with them. There is nobody that is undeserving of the grace of God. And we are not supposed to make judgment calls about that. We are supposed to love everybody equally. There isn't anybody out there that you should look down on or somehow think to yourself, I don't think I need to share Jesus with them. I'm not sure they deserve it anyway. We should be striving to find opportunities to share Jesus with everybody that comes along our path, regardless of what they look like, what they sound like, what they smell like, what they seem like. We should love everyone. God has shown him that he should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, as a result of this understanding, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. 
He was obedient to do exactly what it is that he was supposed to do. Clarity has now come. And once he understood his mission, what he, when he, he knew what he was supposed to do, boom, he did it. And I've been banging on this drum for this is week two now, part two of this series. We have got to be obedient messengers. You cannot tell me that you don't know that you're supposed to share Jesus with people. You now have clarity in your life. You didn't before. I don't know how you didn't before. But if you didn't before, you have clarity now. You are supposed to be sharing Jesus with people. You're supposed to be sharing the good news of the gospel with people. You're supposed to be sharing that Jesus came and died for people and then he rose again to newness of life and we're supposed to be sharing this message with people. You also now have clarity. Now, if you want help with understanding that, help with how do you share this more effectively and issues like this, absolutely. Come knock on my door. We'll have these conversations and whatever it is you need or want for materials and resources and education, all this good stuff, absolutely. But don't tell me you didn't know. Because now you do. Which brings me to my follow-up question. Who did you share Jesus with this last week? Because you know you're supposed to do this. So did you do it? Who did you share Jesus with? And don't just say, oh, you know, I told somebody, you know, I invited them to church. I get it, you're supposed to be invited them to church. That's true. But who did you share Jesus with? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They need to repent of their sins and ask for forgiveness. Who did you share Jesus with this week? God will bring along anybody in your path. And you don't no idea who it's going to be. I was able to share Jesus with a young man this week. It happens all the time if you're looking for these opportunities. So Cornelius says, Four days ago, I was fasting until this hour, until the ninth hour. I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. This angel we read about earlier on in the chapter. Cornelius, your prayers have been heard. Your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging at the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you've done well to come. Now, therefore, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. Now it's Peter's turn to bring some clarity to Cornelius. Boy, that would, I think I would rather have this question asked of me than to be told that I just won the lottery. Who else is feeling that right here? If somebody came to me and said, tell me what do I need to do to get saved? My life's work, guys and gals. More valuable than treasures untold. More valuable than any lottery winning. More valuable than anything else. Leading somebody to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and having them ask you about it so that you can share with them. My stars. How is this not like the dream? And Peter gets set up like in volleyball. Does anybody play volleyball in here, over here? You know, can you imagine that beautiful set? Beautiful set. And now Peter gets to spike it down. I thought you'd like that, Kelia. You ever play volleyball? A couple times? A couple years? Sure. Now Peter's going to spike this question. And the way that he spikes this question may not be the same way that you would spike it. Doesn't mean you're wrong and he's right. It doesn't mean you're right and he's wrong. Because every one of us has the opportunity and the ability, the capacity to share Jesus in different ways. As long as you're sharing some of the same common elements. Jesus died, rose again. Right, you got to have some of the same themes, but Peter's going to talk about some things that maybe you won't bring up in your opportunity to share Jesus, and that's okay. That's okay. 
So Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. I suspect that Peter might have been taken a little bit off guard. I'm not sure that he was expecting when he walked into Cornelius' house that Cornelius was going to ask how to get saved. I'm not sure that's what he had in mind. He, did, he, he admitted he wasn't even supposed to be there, more or less ready to preach the gospel. But I think it just shows that when the opportunity arises and presents itself, Peter's ready, boom, sharing the gospel right now. Doesn't have to say, let me consult my notes, let me call Josh quick, nothing like this. Cold, Peter's able to just, all right, you know what? I perceive in God that there is no partiality. And why does he say that? Because he's standing in front of a Gentile about to share Jesus with them. Uh, he's somewhat speechless. But you know what? In God's eyes, there is no partiality. There isn't somebody that if they were to walk in here would be undeserving of the grace of God. Now, there might be people in here that... If they showed up, you might think that they don't deserve the grace of God. But let me tell you something, they do. We all have enemies and people that we don't always get along with. We all have people that have rubbed us the wrong way. Maybe we don't see eye to eye with them, haven't talked to them for years, etc. You know, you know, you, I'm sure if you thought about it for more than about half a second, you could probably come up with a half a dozen people in your life that you've been like this with for a couple times now. And if they walked into this church building, would they deserve to have Jesus preach to them? And the answer, of course, is yes. Yes. And you could start just like Peter and say, you might not be expecting to share Jesus with them, but you know what? Maybe you'd start the same way that Peter does. In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. He'll even come to a Gentile. Peter might as well just come out and say that. Probably doesn't want to sound mean or crass, though. <laughs> He's probably trying to say it a little bit more diplomatically. I perceive that in God, he shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. That's true. Because even within Israelite history, there were proselytes. There were people who would come into the nation because they saw what God was able to do and they would join the ranks of the Jews. They, they, they might not be Jewish by, by nature or by history or by birth, but they would come and accept the Jewish religion and they would become what they would call proselytes. And Peter rightly admits that when these people would do what they're supposed to do, They'd get along. And Cornelius is one of them. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, now he's talking to because he wants to keep this Jewish. He recognizes that Cornelius is Gentile and God is trying to bend him a little bit here, but this is kind of Peter's way of saying, and it's still Jewish though, right? The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. So I guess that would mean the Gentiles too. You can just hear his gears spinning. Like he's trying to figure out how this is possible and what's the aftermath going to be. Sure, I'll share Jesus with them, but then we'll all just go home and have a snack, right? He is Lord of all. That word which you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea, began from Galilee after the baptism of John, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Now you're going to have to be, I don't care if you're a Jew or you're a Gentile, I don't care if you're rich or poor, I don't care if you're middle class or upper class, this is one of those points that we all got to agree on. Jesus is Lord of all. He's from God. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing. You got to track with this much, at least so far. And we are witnesses of these things, which he both did in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. You got to be on board with this too. Jesus was killed. There's no, there's no debate on this one. If you want to say that it wasn't actually him or something like that, we got problems. All right, they killed Jesus. He hung him on the tree. Him, God raised up on the third day. Here's another one you got to have in your, in your uh, 
in your presentation as you're sharing the gospel with people. He was raised on the third day, guys and gals. Jesus didn't stay in the tomb. God raised him up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive the remission of sins. There is a command Command is returned to Cornelius. Because remember, you got this con almost like a congregation, Cornelius, the servants, the attendants, the relatives, whoever's sitting there. Peter's talking to them, maybe primarily to Cornelius, but he's got an audience. And he's going to give them a command. He's going to tell them that they need to do something. You have to have your sins forgiven. You've got to believe in his name. You cannot just hear this information and just kind of hope for the best. This kind of information demands a response. You can't just take it and just hope for the best. It demands a response. A command is returned to him. What are you going to do about this information? You've received the information that you need to have that God wanted me to share with you. There you go. Now, what are you going to do with it, Cornelius? What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with this information? It's not enough to just have an intellectual understanding of the facts. In the Bible, there's two different types of understanding of the word knowledge. And oftentimes, I'll use a stove to illustrate if, I, if we had a stove up here and I told you that the stove was hot, you would know that the stove is hot. I just told you that the stove is hot. What's the other way to understand that the stove is hot? Touch it. Touch it. If you came up here and put your, ooh, tzz, ah, that's hot. How is it that you get saved? Which understanding? You got to come up here and touch it. It's not enough to just know that the stove is hot. You need to get up here and you need to touch the stove. And there's a lot of people out here in this day and age who just have been told that the stove is hot and they think that they're okay. And I'm trying to tell you they are not okay. You got to know that the stove is hot. You got to come up here and touch it. You got to do something. It's not okay to just kind of sit there and get the information. All right, thanks for that one. I'm going to go home now. That doesn't result in or amount to a hill of beans. And one day when you die and you stand before God and he's going to say, why should I let you into heaven? Well, because somebody told me about Jesus. Eh. Wrong answer. I don't care what you've been told. You know how many lines of garbage you've been told in your life that you continue to believe them even though they're proven to be factually false? Just because you're told something doesn't make any bit of difference about nothing. You got to do something about it. If I'm telling you that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the one who can forgive you of your sins, and you need to repent of this garbage and sewage that you're living in, you can't just say okay and then just go home. You need to repent of your sins. If it's true, then you need to do it. You're going to live your life based upon what you believe is true. Just because you tell me okay and you continue to live your sinful life, it must not be okay then. Evidence that demands a verdict. You've got to do something with this information. Peter gave this message to Cornelius. Having already read it, we already know that Cornelius does something with it. Cornelius at this point doesn't just say, all right, thanks, Peter. Thanks for coming down and sharing with us. All right, guys, let's go home. Let's get in time, time for supper. Is that what he says next? How many of you in here after hearing this message are going to do just that, though? All right, guys, let's what's for lunch. 
or am I stepping on toes with that one? I'm glad Cornelius doesn't just say, let's get home in time for supper. Cornelius is going to do something with this information. It's not just going to fall on deaf ears. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision believed, were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. They believed, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. Do you remember when you believed? When it wasn't just a matter of just an understanding of somebody who told you something, but you actually believed. When you repented of your sins, when you trusted Christ as your Savior, when did that happen for you? It's not enough to just say, I know the information. You've got to take it a step further. You've got to believe on the name of the Savior. You've got to trust Him for your salvation. When you stand up there at the door and God says, why should I let you into heaven? You don't know the answer to that question. You better see me after class. We've got a problem. There is a right answer to that question. Do you have that answer? I'm not just going to tell it to you so you can just have the, again, the intellectual consent of it. You either know it or you don't. The Holy Spirit fell upon them. Those of the circumcision believed. They were astonished. Some wonderful things are happening. A connection is resulted. When you believe the message, when you trust in the message, when you do what you're supposed to do with the message that God is giving to you, a connection is resulted. And we will know that a connection is resulted. If somebody came down this hall and told me that they had trusted Jesus as their Savior, it wouldn't take a whole lot of effort to figure out whether or not they're genuine, whether or not it's true, whether or not it actually happened, or if they're just filling me full of hot air. Did you know that people lie? Did you know that a lot of people lie? A lot of people just want to tell you what you want to hear. Did you know that? And so when you ask them about stuff, did you know that they might be lying to you? I know. Hit me like a ton of bricks too. But you know what? It's just as easy to figure out if somebody's telling the truth. If they're genuine. If what they're saying is actually happening in their life. If you know the scripture, if you know how to discern the spirit, if you've been listening to the five minute messages lately, by the way, I've been talking about discerning the spirit over the last couple of weeks. If you have an understanding of what's going on in the scriptures and things like this, and somebody starts talking to you about spiritual things, it's not real complicated to figure out whether or not they're honest or not. It's not complicated and it's not hard. If you wanted to start talking to me about working at a grocery store, I could tell you in about 10 seconds whether or not you've ever worked at a grocery store. I could talk to Jeff about brazen copper. He's done it a couple times. He'd try to figure out real quick if I'd ever brazed copper before in my life, and it wouldn't take him very long. I could talk to my dad about fixing cars. Well, of course, he already knows that I know what, don't know what I'm talking about. But it wouldn't take him very long to talk to somebody and know whether or not they know anything about fixing cars. It's not hard. I mean, you just know. And if you're a spiritual person and somebody starts talking to you about spiritual things, you're going to know. Come on, guys. Keep with me. It's not going to be too hard to figure out whether or not they know what they're talking about. And in this instance... Peter is seeing the evidence of the Holy Spirit. Why is it that they are allowed to speak in tongues at this time? One of the last times, remember, it doesn't say that they spoke in tongues. Did Luke just overlook that opportunity? Or is there a reason why they're speaking in tongues here? I'm going to guess. I mean, I wasn't there. I didn't write this. But I'm going to guess that the reason why they're speaking in tongues at this point is because 
Gentiles are now believing and Peter doesn't believe it. And Peter's going to need a sign that it's legit. And you know what the gift of tongues is? A sign gift. And Peter gets a sign that this is true and that this is genuine. That's why they're speaking in tongues. And so Peter answered, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit? He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, and they stayed with him a few days. You know, when you start talking about spiritual things, I've got a friend of mine that likes to talk to his friend about spiritual things, and they'll stay awake till 4 o'clock in the morning talking about spiritual things. You know, it's real hard to talk to somebody about certain things. You know, after a little while, even, even Nintendo, I'm going to done talking about Nintendo after a while, you know. It's just, but you know what? Spiritual things, if you want to have a true, genuine connection with somebody and you start talking to them about spiritual things, you could stay awake talking to them until 4 o'clock in the morning and you wouldn't even realize it. You want to have a deep and meaningful conversation, start talking to them about spiritual things. We talk a lot about praying for people and this broke and that. And, so, and that's all great. And we should be praying about those things. You're absolutely right. However, let's be heavenly minded. Let's talk about spiritual things. Does the person that we're praying for who had a broken leg, or do they know the Lord is their Savior? Maybe we need to pray about that. Just throwing it out there. Do they need to know Jesus as their Savior? Do they need to be discipled? Are they going to church? Let's talk about All of a sudden, whoa, we're talking about a lot of stuff here. Who's the last one that asked you about how your church was going? Or when's the last person you asked about how church went for, for them on Sunday? You have these kinds of conversations. They asked him to stay with them for several days. Not just a couple hours, not just over one meal, several days. A connection is resulted. The Holy Spirit connects with them. They start connecting with each other. And all of a sudden, a bond is established that nobody can break. What a wonderful conclusion to this Acts chapter 10. I don't even know if Peter saw this one coming. But how awesome is this when everybody's obedient to do whatever it is that they're supposed to be doing and God's will is being carried out and these messengers are doing what they're supposed to be doing. We see people get saved. We see the message of the gospel being proclaimed and everything going the way it's supposed to be going. Sometimes we see our lives kind of out of control and chaotic and we just can't quite figure out why. Some of me wonders if some of the reason for the chaos is because we're not doing what God wants us to do. And why do we have such order and clarity here? Because everybody's doing what God wants them to do. Next week, we move on to chapter 11. And it just gets better and better from here. Let's pray.